So to the question, um, you know, what do you do when a, when a patient has got rising PSA, has already been castrated, um, and what's the, the patient's expectation that you're going to do some more? Yeah. Um, and uh, this is where we are with uh, Spartan and Prospera. Yeah. And do you think there are markers for, you know, when you're following a patient who is castrate and he's non-metastatic, do you, do you think PSA dynamics is important? Do you think the, the doubling time or the, 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 the velocity of the PSA is an important predictor of metastatic disease? Or are, are, there, are there signs that you would say this patient is more likely to progress sooner than this other patient? Yeah, I, I think the critical question is, uh, how likely is the patient to die of prostate cancer? Yeah. And there are some groups around the world who've looked at this and looked at it in a very um, thoughtful way. So if you take the Hopkins data, Johns Hopkins, uh, a big center, pioneer center for radical prostatectomy, very brave in not hormone manipulating patients until they got metastases. And Mario Eisenberger and the team there uh, have actually looked at patients who have got rising PSAs post prostatectomy. So some factors, critical, PSAs below 10, PSA doubling time, combination of the two. There's a whole tranche of patients who really aren't going to die from their disease, who are 10 years out, even 15 years out, and they're not progressing. By contrast, there is a group who've got high, much higher PSAs rapidly doubling, and we know that they're the ones that potentially may be in trouble. So I think the PSA, the absolute level of PSA and the PSA kinetics are important. I think grade also plays into that, and the biology, uh, you know, we know that certain very high-grade tumours, uh, tumours with cribriform architecture and so on, um, are really the bad actors. And they're the ones to pick out from the crowd, so to speak. Nick, would you differentiate a patient who's recurring post-radiotherapy versus post-surgery? Um, I think post-surgery, you've potentially got the option of salvage. Yeah. And yeah. so we tend to put... Uh, but actually, both groups, through the PET scanning thing, because often you'll find that the relapse is outside the area you've treated and you've got a second bite at the cherry, which yeah. at the very least postpones hormone therapy. So the idea of stereotactic yes. radiotherapy or some form of local therapy yeah. to the metastases. And there's some very important data being presented at Astro, uh, at the other side of the world, yeah. showing that uh, radical radiotherapy with stereotactic techniques for oligometastatic disease prolonged survival, uh, randomised phase two, but very persuasive data. Um, I think in the sort of M0 CRPC setting, again, I, I agree with Noel about everything in terms of, yeah, you, there's a subgroup who are clearly going to progress to metastatic disease yep. quickly. Those are the ones that went into Spartan and Prosper, and both trials very clearly show that you've got a big delay in your time to progression uh, with metastatic progression with adding upfront AR targeting therapies, two very similar drugs. But they also show some quite you know, concerning for me, side effects, increase in falls, increase in deaths from non-prostate cancer causes. So uh, the, you're certainly harming some of these people. You may be benefiting more, but there's, it's not without risk and without harm. And uh, so I, and that neither trial showed an OS gain, although there was a trend towards an OS gain. Um, but I just do question whether you need to give that much treatment that early and whether you would even have started from there in the first place, uh, to use a kind of slightly Irish phrase around. <laughs> so that, I mean, it, brings me on, it brings me nicely on then, to, I mean, you yeah. really mentioned the, the end point of these studies that really yes. has got these drugs, yes. their approval is metastasis free survival. Yeah. What do you think about that as an end point in, the, in this setting? Well, I, I am a bit worried that it's not the right endpoint because by the time they get their metastatic progression on apalutamide or enzalutamide, you have comprehensively used up one of your main CRPC things. So you're left giving them chemo, basically. I know people will say, well, you can give them abiraterone, but we know that abi enza enza abi is no different from just giving one, really. Yes. Yeah. The median time to progression is the gap between your first and your second assessment. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, so it's, it's a, it's, you're just burning money, really. So, so essentially, once they roll off the end of that, they're going to be looking at chemo and not much else, and ra well, radium. Yeah. But um, so I, 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 I'm sceptical that these will ever mature into much of a survival gain. So you don't think it's a, a, yeah. as meaningful as uh, an endpoint, as obviously it's not as overall, sort of overall survival, but cl clinically for the patients, it's not really that meaningful, do you think? Well, I think it is. I mean, I think, I mean, we, 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 I, I was in the session this morning arguing that not relapsing is good for your quality of life, but it depends what price you have to pay to not relapse. Yeah. So if you're giving agents that are profoundly depleting all your androgens, that is bound to be affecting your quality of life. It'll affect your muscle bulk, it'll affect your bone density potentially, it'll certainly affect your energy levels and so on. And um, so I'm not sure your quality of life unrelapsed in that state 
is quite the same, is certainly not the same as not being on treatment. And there's likely some financial yes. toxicity as well for these agents in this setting. There is, yeah. I would imagine, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. No, what, what do you think, I mean, these, do, these drugs have been approved by the FDA in North America. What, what do you think of the European situation, how, how, will, how will things uh, evolve here in Europe with regard to these agents, apalutamide, enflutamide in the M0 CRPC space? Well, I think there'll be a demand. Yeah. Um, I think that it will be different in different European countries as to how it's handled from a regulatory standpoint. Coming from the UK, which we all do, we know that NICE will look at this, they'll look at the cost, they'll look at the benefit, and they'll turn it into some kind of quality adjusted life year and ask the question, how many life years has this saved and at what cost has that uh, been to the taxpayer? And I expect that they will turn it down, um, but we'll see. Well, neither trial showed a quality of life gain. Um, so you've got and, and, and no OS gain, so it's hard to see how there's any quality gain at all. Um, so it, 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 I, I, I agree, I think it's unlikely they'll approve it. I th I would, if I were nice, I would re reiterate the guidelines which are already there as well, which is to say actually just monitor people more yeah. and you can intervene with early metastatic disease where we've got actually good data yeah. as to what strategies work to prolong survival. And, and, and then we know we can prolong survival in that setting, whereas we can't prolong, that these haven't shown you prolonged survival. Yeah. So it may be that we're over-treating yes. and potentially exposing patients to the risk of bone ill health yeah. Yeah. as well as the general physical decline as well. Absolutely, and there's, a, there's, there's, there's not just the, the, the financial cost, there's the opportunity cost in our time monitoring and doling out all these pills assuming they were funded. Yeah, um, I, yeah I'm sceptical that these are really significant advances. I think that one thing uh, that, that we've been lucky enough to show in the M0 part of the Stampede study, which I have to say has been largely ignored by yeah. the international community, yeah. is that a relatively short burst of intensive treatment, be it with docetaxel or with abiraterone, in that M0 really high risk setting, actually yields a great deal of benefit. So, um, for example, in the abiraterone uh, treated group of M0 patients, the event rate, in other words the failure rate, after two years of abiraterone right up front, has been um, vanishingly small um, and what we know is that the the delta effect in other words the amount of benefit that you get from treating early rather than treating in castrate resistance is much much greater so my gut feeling is that we should really concentrate on isolating and identifying those really high-risk patients early on and treating them aggressively rather than treating them when they fail in this Yes, yeah, so if we're thinking of unmet needs in this area, it's really that, isn't it? It's yeah. identifying those patients. Yeah, yeah exactly. Stopping, stopping them failing in the first place. Yeah, so be be better, to, better yeah. treatment earlier on, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, the striking, uh, I entire, again, I entirely agree. I mean, the, the fail, if you look at the failure-free survival hazard ratios for both docetaxel in M0 and abiraterone in M0, they are bigger numerically than the, than the hazard ratios in the M1 setting. It looks like these drugs work better in the, the, in the M0 than the M1 setting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, that's been a great discussion about an, an M0 CRPC and also hormone sensitive metastatic disease. And then we're going to move on to bone health uh, in, in prostate cancer.